I am joined now by NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine to talk about what we've seen unfolding here today. Jim, thanks for joining us. Well, it's great to be here. We did have, in fact, a very successful launch this morning on an Atlas V rocket. Uh, the Centaur upper stage worked splendidly with two RL-10 engines, uh, which is new as well. Uh, but you're right, the Starliner itself, um, on its way to the International Space Station, uh, had a challenge. And that challenge was it, it, it did not do the orbital insertion burn the way we were anticipating. Uh, we, we made an effort to uh, command it to do that burn. What it really comes down to is automation. Um, what we were trying to do is make sure that we could do this entire mission end-to-end -end completely automated. Um, and that, that, that didn't work, and so then we started to try to get it command signals, and it seems like those command signals did not get received by the spacecraft either. But here's what's important. The spacecraft is in orbit. The spacecraft is safe. If we would have had astronauts on board, they would have been safe. And yeah. in fact, if we would have ast had astronauts on board, they would probably have taken over manually and it'd be flying to the International Space Station right now. But there's a lot of testing yet to do. The spacecraft is in orbit. We're going to bring it home to White Sands, New Mexico in the coming days. Um, and I think it's, there are a lot of successes from today's test. So a lot of successes, but the fact that it is not actually going to the International Space Station and docking and staying there for yes. a week as originally planned, is that a failure? Oh, it's not a failure. I would say it's certainly something that, um, that we wanted to see happen. Uh, but it's also true that um, we're, we test for a reason uh, because we, we want to be able to, to learn these things that we need to learn so that when we do put humans on board, they can go and be safe. Um, but we also have to remember, when we had the space shuttles, uh, we went to the International Space Station with humans for the first time, and they, and they flew it themselves. And in fact, when we landed on the moon, <laughs> we went for the first time with humans, and they flew it themselves. Um, so it, with humans in the loop in the spacecraft, in, in many cases, it's actually better. Uh, but in this case, the automation didn't work the way we were hoping. Yeah, and I, I think for maybe our viewers out there who are not so familiar, we don't currently have the capability to send astronauts from U.S. soil to space right That's now. Right. That is the purpose of this commercial crew program overall, which includes Boeing and SpaceX. Um, having been able to do that for more than eight years now, what does this do to the timeline for Boeing to be able to bring astronauts to low Earth orbit? So we're still working through that. We're going to get a lot of good data and information. Here's what NASA does. We learn, we make fixes, and we move forward. And that's what we intend to do. Now, uh, the question I get asked a lot, well, is the next one going to have humans on board? Well, it's too early to know. We've got a lot of data we need to get through um, and a lot of things we need to learn. Uh, but we do want to move fast. It's also a reason we have two providers. These are commercial crew providers. NASA is not owning and operating the equipment. We're, we're, we're buying a ride from a robust commercial marketplace. And as you said, Boeing and SpaceX are very dissimilar capabilities, which means if one has a setback, the other one continues to move forward in its development, which SpaceX will continue to do. But I don't, I don't anticipate um, that this is going to give us a long-term struggle. I think what this is going to do is it's going to, it's going to give us things to learn. And, um, and you know, you, in fact, you could argue that uh, you learn a lot more when you have an anomaly than when you have everything go right. I realize there are a lot of question marks still around all of this, um, but if we do see that timeline slip back. The financial implications of that, where does that fall? So that is an important thing. Uh, remember, we're buying the service and we need these commercial crew providers to be successful so we can buy more services. NASA's goal is to be a customer. We want to be one customer of many customers in a robust commercial marketplace for human space flight in low Earth orbit. We also want to have numerous providers that are competing against each other on cost and innovation. And when there is a setback, obviously that can have a, a, you know, a, a feedback when it comes to um, maybe a provider not being able to, to win the next contract, whether it's NASA or some other commercial company that wants access to space for the value of microgravity. Um, so that's up to those commercial companies to figure out. Uh, there is no doubt um, that there will be an impact. Uh, but again, this is the United States of America. We take risks and we move forward. And given the fact that this is a public-private partnership, it is essentially a, a newer business model for NASA. Been a lot of focus on the price per seat yeah. with both SpaceX and Boeing. What is it? Uh, well, it, we, <laughs> we need to negotiate that at this point. What we're doing is we are partnering with them in the development of two dissimilar capabilities that we will then be able to buy rides from. Uh, but it's also important to note that those costs are going to come down. The more rides happen, the co more costs come down. The, the, the more commercial companies want access to space, the more international partners want access to space, the more the cost to NASA comes down. So I think that's, that's a, a, net, a net positive. So 
finally, um, given the fact that Commercial Crew restores that U.S. capability for human spaceflight, how much hinges on this happening uh, when you start to look ahead to some of the other longer-term goals of NASA, whether it's Artemis and bringing Americans back to the moon or after that Mars? So we go to low Earth orbit for a purpose. We go to low Earth orbit to learn how to live off the Earth for long periods of time. Why? So that we can go to the moon. And we go to the moon for a purpose. Why? Because we want to go to Mars. You know, when you go to Mars, you have to be there for a couple of years because Earth and Mars are on the same side of the sun once every 26 months. So we have to do a lot of learning in low Earth orbit and at the moon. Um, but as far as getting to the moon, I, I don't think that there's any impact here. Um, I think ultimately, the, the, in fact, I don't think, I know that this is a, a, a capability for getting to low Earth orbit. It is not a capability to get to the moon. For that, we have an entirely different rocket, an entirely different capsule, and so it should not impact the Artemis program, which our objective given by the president is to land the first woman and the next man on the south pole of the moon in 2024.